State Senator Joe Pittman joins us in studio this morning as we talk about, well, various items at the beginning of your first full term in the Senate. Conversation brought to you by Marcus and Mack, a law firm representing injured people. Senator, good morning. Todd, good morning. We talked earlier this week following what was a very chaotic opening session of the legislature in Harrisburg, uh, but then uh, that was absolutely overwhelmed by what happened in in the nation's capital in Washington. Uh, Your reaction to everything that you saw go down? Sadness. More than anything, sadness. Uh, It's terrible to see what happened. That type of violence has no place in our society. And what's been increasingly bothersome to me is what I see as this blame game over uh, what organization, what group uh, was responsible for all of this. You hear MAGA people, Antifa people, BLM people, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's the people that actually perpetuated the violence. Those are the individuals, and I don't care what brand you want to put on them. Uh, Those are the individuals that conducted this violence. They need to be held to account. And I think it needs to be reinforced that we need to take a step back and really evaluate how we treat each other and how we treat our constitutional republic. We have tolerated this kind of violence, whether what we've seen in the Capitol, whether what we see in the Pacific Northwest, what we see in the city of Philadelphia. And it is condemnable it's not the way we should be conducting business and i just find it to be sad and disappointing and uh, i am just thankful that at this point the president has committed to a full and orderly transition on january 20th and it is time for all of us to move forward and try to figure out how we repair our discourse in this country from a practical standpoint and a security standpoint, um, I asked this in the same way to uh, Representative Struzzi yesterday. Did it surprise you how easily they were able to breach the Capitol, and does that concern you about the way the setup is in Harrisburg? Well, I, I don't have the full context of the vo- volume of individuals that were in the Capitol city that day versus the level of security that the Capitol has available to it. Uh, I do know that in Harrisburg we attempt to account for events and functions and the need for potential increased security uh, around those. But these are unpredictable times, and I don't know that you could ever fully anticipate the actions of others and ensure that you have a fail-safe in place for every circumstance. I I just don't think that's possible. Uh, You know, we have law enforcement for a very good reason, obviously, Uh, but I go back to my fundamental point of um, people have to respect the laws and respect each other um, because otherwise we have anarchy. We only have so much ability to enforce and defend and um, that kind of behavior just doesn't uh, I I don't know how you anticipate it yeah yeah well it's much like uh, workplace shootings and school shootings and those sorts of things Uh, you go through the review process you do the best that you can but it's it's really unpredictable where there's a will there's a way let us move on to other topics as we begin the new session in Harrisburg of course one of the things that is left over from uh, from previous times is the uh, Reggie public comment period comes to an end next week where do you see it going from there well we're going to continue to pursue this just yesterday I met with the Armstrong County commissioners who unanimously approved a resolution Uh, opposing this process and opposing Reggie. Uh, They, like Indiana County, have very strong concerns. I've had conversations with the Armstrong School District as well. I go back to some of the benefits of the power-generating facilities that we don't recognize or appreciate, and that is the property tax payments that these plants pay. We're talking about $5 million a year between the four power plants that Armstrong and Indiana County hosts. Set aside the economic generation, set aside the employment, uh, the use of the natural resources, 
we had we will have a public education crisis in this region by virtue of those plants not paying property taxes. So we're going to continue to beat that drum and deliver that message. I continue to implore the governor to explain to us how Reggie and its negative impacts, which his administration acknowledge on this immediate community economically, are going to be offset. And uh, I go back to carbon capture, sequestration technologies, conversion to natural gas. You know, I'm open to any discussions as long as he continues to pursue this path. But it's got to be a two-way street dialogue. And so we're going to continue to speak up. I urge all the listeners to speak up and express that concern. Even if you think Reggie is a good idea, you have to acknowledge that we need a game plan going forward, and we can't develop a game plan without the support and help of the governor, and we've not had it. All right, let's talk about uh, what you would like to see happen in this uh, first six months of the new year with the new General Assembly in place, and what are some of your top priorities? We, we need to focus on election reform. We can talk a lot about what happened after November 3rd, but what bothers me is what happened leading up to November 3rd. We have an election code. We have a, an election law that is designed to have uniformity and consistency in our process throughout the Commonwealth. And what we saw leading up to the election, and that's why we were very vocal through legal avenues and and other public avenues was a twisting of our election laws. Everything from allowing ballots to show up three days after the election to removing the signature verification on ballots to removing the dating requirement to the drop boxes that showed up uh, to the limiting of poll watchers when ballots were being counted. All of that fed into a perception of fraudulent activity. And all of that was done without the consent of the legislature. We have laws in place. We use the word shall for a reason. Shall means must. And I never imagined that we would be debating that definition. And that's where we are right now. The most recent state Supreme Court ruling indicated that shall doesn't really mean shall. And if we're going to continue to write laws, we need to understand what words really mean. And if we can't rely on the fact that shall means you must sign and date a ballot, then that's a difficult path forward. But we've got to get our arms around election reform. There's no question about it. Uh, since we talked with you about the uh, Brewster situation in the state Senate the other day, have there been changes? Has there been progress? Uh, my understanding is that that is all within the federal courts. Uh, filings are occurring, I believe, today. In the Western District of the federal courts, that judge will then obviously select the time frame of his choosing. We in the Senate do have the petition from Mrs. Zicarelli contesting the election. We have Mr. Brewster's response. Uh, that will then have to play out through our rules committee and then ultimately the full body to make an ultimate decision on who should be seated in the 45th. All right. So that's one priority for you is election reform. What are some of the other things you want to see happen? Well, we, we've got to deal with the pandemic. Increasingly, we're getting questions about the rollout of the vaccine. Mm -hmm. I believe the Department of Health is attempting to do this as an orderly uh, way as possible, dealing with frontline workers and nursing homes first and foremost. Our economics are, are, are you know, we're seeing just this week we saw more business closures. Uh, the longer these shutdowns occur economically, the more detrimental this impact is going to have, and we're going to... Um, feel these effects for many years. And so we've got to refocus locally on economic development, but also more broadly, we, we really need to get to the point of responsibly reopening our economy. I was encouraged to see that the governor yesterday came out with new recommendations for school districts that further encouraged in-person learning for students, particularly in primary school elementary education. I think that we 
are starting to realize the impact that we're having by not having our children in school on a regular basis to their long-term learning. Health department moving fast enough on this vaccine. There has been criticism of them. Okay, they're treating it as a nine-to-five job and take the weekends off, and, and that's not good enough. Well, I, I, I'm not going to pass total judgment on how they're approaching this because I don't know the supply chain of the vaccine. And one of the concerns that we all have is that most of these vaccines require two doses. And I think there's a concern about providing too many initial doses and not being able to provide the second dose in a timely manner, because if you don't do that, you lose the effectiveness of the first dose. So I think it's a difficult balance for them to uh, to do that. Um, I understand that even many of the frontline workers are choosing to uh, defer on taking the vaccine, which is certainly their choice. So I think that is complicating the the ability to gauge how many vaccines need to be go, need to go where in a timely manner. Uh, the Department of Health has not been a very responsive department, and candidly, that has been before the pandemic, and that has crossed bipartisan administrations. Uh, the Department of Health, in my opinion, has been one of the departments that does not have a very high level of responsiveness. And honestly, in my 20 years with the state Senate working for Senator White and now, that's been a consistent problem. Yeah. We're understanding that the second round begin today across the Commonwealth for those who got it on the first eligible day. Uh, and that'll be happening at IRMC as well. Um, this is a curveball question that I'm going to throw at you, um, and uh, you can choose to take it for a ball or, or take a swing at it. <laughs> I'll be the umpire. Rumors that uh, Governor Wolf will resign and become a member of uh, President-elect Biden's cabinet or take some uh, federal position, and then the succession then of uh, John Fetterman uh, to Pennsylvania governor. What would that look like from the Senate standpoint? Well, rumors are just that, rumors. Uh, I would be very concerned, candidly, about our lieutenant governor being the chief executive of this commonwealth, and I say that by his conduct in presiding over the Senate. And much of what happened on Tuesday could have been avoided if the presiding officer would have presided and followed the parliamentary procedures that we have in place, whether... They like it or not, we had 26-plus votes to make the changes and to choose not to seat Senator Brewster at the time. And he he purposefully and willfully ignored those rules. I go back to some of our initial conversations about law and order. You have to have that kind of continuity. And he he completely ignored it. I would be very concerned with him at the helm of our state if that were to happen, uh, Senator Corman, the president pro tempore, would then also serve as the lieutenant governor, giving us then a divided government within the executive branch. But I've heard nothing other than those rumors that there's a chance this could happen. All right. Um, final question for Senator Joe Pittman this morning has to do. Oh, gosh, it just escaped me. Uh, but, but it was a really good one. Uh, it, um Oh, man, I was I was just thinking of it and it went away. Well, Senator Pittman, uh, uh, through the uh, entire process of uh, what's happening in Harrisburg and, and everything else that has been going on, uh, we continue to struggle and, and to fight through this pandemic. And uh, and you have made very clear your position on uh, government. I know what the question was now um, on mm. on the governor's executive powers. Uh, do we get a new constitutional amendment uh, passed this year and do you get the feel that the voters would approve it? Yes and yes. I believe we will pass it. Whether we pass it in time to be placed on the ballot in May or November is a question of timing. But I'm quite certain the votes are there. And based on the feel that I get from the general public, there is a real concern that any executive – Republican or Democrat or whatever party should not have the unilateral power to make these kinds of decisions for this length of time. All right. He is Senator Joe Pittman. I knew I'd find that question in there somewhere. I thought you were going to ask me about my beard and why I shaved it. I, well, <laughs> I love the beard. I have to admit, uh, I love the beard, not because it covered up your lovely face, but uh, because I just thought it looked cool 
on a, on a lawmaker. But you can grow it back anytime. Well, I, I can grow it back. And the prevailing opinion is that that people like the beard. But my mom doesn't, and so that's the opinion that matters. Senator <laughs> <laughs> Pippen, thanks so much. Thank you, Todd. Much. Thank you, Todd. Much. Thank